Hello everyone. In my previous video, I briefly mentioned that Euclid was able to prove that there were an infinite number of prime numbers using nothing but geometry. This video is to show you exactly how he did that. His proof is found in his book, The Elements, Volume 9, Proposition 20. We'll go through it step by step with me using my mad Microsoft Paint skills to give some illustrations as well. So like with most proofs, we start off with some definitional statements. Here we begin, let A, B, C be the assigned prime numbers. I say that there are more prime numbers than A, B, C. Now you're probably thinking, what in the world does that mean? Well, earlier Euclid had already defined what a prime number is. We don't have to do that here since most of you should already know what a prime number is. But let's just start off by just giving some examples of what A, B, and C are using what we know to be prime numbers. To do so, uh, let's start with a unit line like this. Now, a unit line just means that this line is exactly one length long. It doesn't really matter what the length is, just that every other length will be in proportion to this one. So I picked our unit length to be 25 pixels in Microsoft Paint. From this, we can define our proportional lengths of A, B, and C. But remember, these can actually be any prime numbers. I'm keeping them as the lengths of two units, three units, and five units to keep us from going completely insane trying to draw out giant prime number lines, okay? So here they are relative to each other. And with this in mind, let's look at our next step. For let, um, yeah, yes, th that's what was written in the uh, Perseus Digital Library, which is where I have pulled this text from. Incidentally, the Perseus project is maintained by Tufts University's Department of Classical Studies, and I highly recommend you check them out. I'll provide a link to this specific passage from Euclid in the description below. Anyway, back to what it says. For let the least number measured by A, B, C be taken, and let it be D, E. Let the unit D, F be added to D, E. Now, I get why somebody reading this is going to hate geometry. It's a bit of a mouthful to go through, but the good news is it's very logical. And to explain it, we just have to first ask, what does it mean that a number is measured by A, B, or C? Because knowing that, you'll actually pretty quickly understand what the rest is going on. Basically, in our modern lingo today, to measure a number means that you have found a factor of a number with the number you're measuring by. So the number 15, for example, is measured by both 3 and 5, since 3 and 5 are both factors of 15. So let's move this over a bit and look at how we find out what the least number measured by A, B, and C is, which is when A, B, and C are each lengths of a line that are part of that complete line. I, again, uh, it's easier to just show this than it is to explain it sometimes. So first, let's pull down each length of line, and um, now let's just kind of squish them together so it's easier to compare them. The first thing you'll notice is that line A is the shortest line. So we're going to need to increase the length of A, and we do that by grabbing another copy of A. And now we move that copy down and we put it at the end of the currently existing length of A. When we slide that over, now you can see that B is the shortest line. So we grab a copy of B and we add that to line B. And now we just repeat the process. A is once again the smallest, so we grab a copy of A and slap it on. And, and look at that, line A and line B are now equal to each other. But sadly, they do not equal line C. So, you know the drill. And there we go. All lines are of equal length now. So let's look back at the step in the proof again. This new line we have just created is defined as DE. Now, it doesn't really matter what side we label as D and what side we label as E, but because I know what's coming in this proof, I'm going to label this line as E and D here. But it doesn't really matter since E and D is the same as D and E. 
so we can do whichever order we want. So we can now add DE represented here. And the last bit of the step is that we have DF represent our unit. Oh, well, that's easy enough. We just copy that bit over here. And as it says, let the unit DF be added to DE. So that gives us DE plus DF down here. Now, this is part of why I chose to label the point E where I did, because I chose to add the DF unit to the right side of the line. I could have added it to the left side and reverse which point was D or which point was E for that. But again, these are equivalent, so it, just go with it. It's fine. <laughs> Either way, we now have a newly constructed line, which we can now call EF. So we get to the next step. Then EF is either prime or not. Yeah, that's a pretty straightforward sentence. It's true, it's either prime or not. So uh, so, so on to the next step. First, let it be prime. Then the prime numbers A, B, C, E, F have been found, which are more than A, B, C. In other words, if E, F is itself a prime number, then we have found another prime number. And this means that we have proven that there are more prime numbers than A, B, C, which is what we started with. So let's continue to the opposite side of that branch. Next, let EF not be prime. Therefore, it is measured by some prime number. Now, this again goes back to what the definition of a prime number is, a number with no factors, well, other than the factor of one, of course. The fact that to be measured by some number means that a number is a factor of that number, it means that in this case, if EF is not prime, there must be some number that is a factor which is prime. So clearly, if EF is not prime, then it must contain factors, and those factors will have to be prime numbers at some point as well. Now, we don't know what number EF represents at this point, but the next step does give us a variable name for it. So we continue. Let it be measured by the prime number G. Now again, we don't know how long G needs to be. So I'm leaving the actual line as a question mark here. We can draw it out later if we find out what it does represent. But for now, let's just see what other conclusions we can draw at this point in the argument. The next step Euclid gives is, I say that G is not the same with any of the numbers A, B, C. In other words, the claim is that G cannot be A, it cannot be B, and it cannot be C. And thankfully, Euclid provides his reasoning. He begins by saying, for, if possible, let it be so. In other words, let's go ahead and assume that G is one of those values. If that is the case, Euclid continues, now A, B, C measure D, E, therefore G also will measure D, E. And this again makes perfect sense. If G is the same as A, and A is a factor of D, E, then G is also a factor of D, E. And that would be true if G is the same as B or C as well. So on to the next step. But it also measures E, F. And by it, we're still referring to G. And the point Euclid is making is that if, if G is the same as A, B, or C, then G measures both the line D, E and the line E, F. Therefore, G, being a number, will measure the remainder, the unit DF, which is absurd. See, if G measures both DE and EF, then it has to measure DF as part of that. But DF is the unit variable. It is equivalent to saying that G is a factor of 1, which, as Euclid pointed out, is absurd. And this brings us to the conclusion of the argument. Therefore, G is not the same with any one of the numbers A, B, C. And by hypothesis, it is prime. Therefore, the prime numbers A, B, C, G have been found, which are more than the assigned multitude of A, B, C. And that is the final line of the proof. And the nice thing about this proof is that it works regardless of what values we put in for A, B, C, as long as they're prime. It even works no matter how many more values we put in. Hopefully you can see just how the physical objects that Euclid and other geometrists used back in the day were fully capable of providing these same thoughts and therefore being able to be used as proof in the same exact way that we do now. But this was hundreds of years before Christ even walked on the earth. And with all that, I hope you have a wonderful day.